Welcome to the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser, who has gone from a studio of one to directing at Space Station Animation to supervising at Steamroller Animation, continuously developing over 15 feature film pitches on a quest to master the art of making deeply meaningful animated films. So today our guest is Mike Morris. He is currently directing animation on the Tuttle Twins, but he has a, this big, long history in the animation industry. It's a really cool history. You've worked on games. You've worked on programs like Yabba Dabba Dinos and art yeah, Phineas and Ferb Comics, all kinds of just different cool products that, that all kind of center on, around the idea of good entertainment and great storytelling. And uh, I'm excited to talk to you today. This is a little bit different than our regular episodes. We actually have, um, we usually do this live, but this isn't quite live because we're at the Animation Expo in Salt Lake City. And this is an event that I wasn't sure what to expect. So this is pre-recorded, but uh, we're going to have a great conversation regardless. So is there anything you'd like to add that I didn't say? Um, no, I've, just been, I've been working in animation since 2006. I graduated from CalArts and then um, I got was fortunate enough to get a job on The Simpsons, uh, I think around season 17 or 18, and uh, was there for almost nine years. So that was like, it was it was like going from uh, animation school to cartoon making school, kind of, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. it was just like a secondary education about, you know, uh, I think that really formed a lot of my ideas about um, filmmaking in general, mm -hmm. as far as how to tell a joke, how to reveal something, how to you know, do just the, do the, this and that. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's uh, sort of sparked a career that's lasted for me for uh, quite a while, almost, yeah. almost 20 years now. It'll be 20 years in, in two years. Has it been that long? I bet it has. I'm about half of that, but <laughs> not, not, much, not much less than half, or not much, yeah, it's just a bit more than half of that. But, yeah, that's great. Sounds like a great career, and, um, so yeah. So good. <laughs> yeah, and we were also talking about this thing you did called Animation Dance Party for Wacom. Yes. It was a fun passion project. Uh, speak more to what, what that was and how that ties into your love of storytelling and entertainment. Well, you know, um, coming uh, from a background where, uh, you know, I didn't necessarily have uh, a lot of stuff just sort of given to me for, you know, things. I, I mean, I had a really great childhood, don't get me wrong, but, like, if I wanted something, you know, chances are I would have to go out and get it because I had, uh, you know, a lot of brothers and sisters that also had needs as well. And so, you know, it's not like you can just go out to the grocery store or to the store and just buy whatever you feel like at any time. Right. right? And I know there's a lot of people in that same boat that are working on their talents. And, you know, I was fortunate enough to have very, very supportive parents who, um, you know, would get me art supplies and, and didn't like try to you know, say, oh, well, you know, you're going to, you want to do an art? Yeah. Really? <laughs> really? Why don't you go get a real job like other people? Like I had friends that were like that and it always made me so sad and very, felt very blessed because my parents were always very, very supportive of me going into art as a career. Yeah. And, um, you know, birthday presents with the you know, reams of paper and, uh, you know, I'd go through it all. Yeah. Right. And just draw and draw and draw and draw and draw. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. But, um, so animation dance party started out, it was actually in a series of other events. We did one called the Cintiq Showdown. But um, Wacom was very generous and kind in the way that they uh, were, and Toon Boom as well, mm -hmm. uh, offering various prizes for those who, who win because I think that good talent should be rewarded with tools to make their art. Yeah. Right? And so those competitions and stuff kind of became a way for me to um, – give back a little bit, mm -hmm. give back with the help of others that actually had the resources to give back. Yeah. And so through the generosity of these companies and, and, you know, um, I feel kind of bad, but my friends at Wacom took a little bit of heat and then last little while, I think undeserved, uh, for some stuff that happened. And, but I've only known them to be just absolutely wonderful and amazing supporters of the arts and, um, they continue to be so. So, um, I, I feel very lucky that I've been able to to work with amazing people at Toon Boom and Wacom and um, other places. Art Station um, gave us some some stuff one time. Um, you know, uh, before before them, it was the people at Moho and um, Clip Studio Paint and all these different software companies because 
so much of the entertainment now is digital yeah. that uh, <clears throat> you kind of need these tools, right? You need the, the tablets and the laptop and the, you know, all the software. And MSI recently came on, uh, who's also sponsoring this show. Mm -hmm. um, MSI came on and added laptops to the equation. Um, and so the last uh, person that won, a, a young lady by the name of Grace Wang, she won an entire basic studio setup, right? Laptop, uh, Cintiq, and um, a year's worth of Tomb Boom to go run rampant with her creative ideas. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that, I, and I would love to do it again. Last, this last time we, we were having a little bit of a budgetary issue, so we didn't get to do it. But, um, you know, I get to run a crew and hire some friends to do uh, a little intro video. And we, yeah. we get in to the dance party through this intro video, and then we have a little outro and into the credits. Yeah. And in the credits, uh, I think the second time around, we started putting the dancers next to their names. So anybody who had a dance in there had a little gif you know, type looping thing. They were all looping animations mm -hmm. um, that had their name next to it so you could know who did what. And I think I like to give people the opportunity to do stuff, especially when they feel like they don't have an opportunity elsewhere. You know, I, um, one of the things that's come to my attention lately is um, this uh, idea of artists seeking validation for what they want to do. Mm -hmm. So I have several friends that I know that haven't had much luck with the studio system, right? Right. And so, it's the, hard. It's hard to break into the studio system. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I've had a dry cough for a couple of weeks. <laughs> embarrassing more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. But um, I, I feel like so many, uh, you know, young young people that are going out into, I say young people, but I don't feel old, I guess. But <laughs> maybe maybe my beard kind of betrays me a little bit. So. Just, just don't this. look at his beard. It'll just be hide this. I'll just have my hand here the rest of the podcast. Yeah. Um, no, but but I think people seek validation for sources that they shouldn't. You know, um, I think people get into this idea that like if I don't get accepted by a studio right away, that I'm no good or that you know my talent isn't sufficient for what for what it is. And honestly, I don't I don't I don't think that could be further from the truth. You know, or I think it's very far from the truth actually. That that's. Uh, them thinking that they're not good enough couldn't be further from the truth. Because yeah, that's that's very very true. I, I think honestly, it because just comes down to process. Yeah. And it comes down to um, you know being an unknown quantity versus somebody whom they may have worked with before, right? So you get opportunities, and sometimes you know people break through and get lucky, but um, you know, just because the studio doesn't pick you up right away, doesn't necessarily mean that you're not good. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, in my situation, and the audience probably already knows this about me, is I got my first job working on it in the Chicks, Chipmunks 3, oh, yeah. and then I was unemployed for 18 months, you know? And and I was like talking about this idea of breaking back into the industry, where in the, in the beginning I thought, okay, it's just breaking in once, right? And then I'd be done and I'd be ready. Yeah. But it just didn't happen that way. And I'm currently, um, you know, shopping around 15 feature film pitches. And, you know, I, I keep reaching this point where you know, the seeking validation come, idea comes up and then I'm like, I don't need that. I can just keep working on it. I can just keep yeah. developing this thing. I can just keep following this passion and eventually things may come into place to be able to do it. Yeah. So yeah, I, that really resonates really strong with me. I love, I love that talking point. If you want to keep talking, you, uh, you can. You but know, I, think we, I think we should because, um, you know, so I was recently lucky enough to go to the IMAG masterclasses in Paris. Um, I actually, wow. I actually recently um, uh, got back um, on Wednesday, yeah. <laughs> and today's Friday. So I had uh, quick turnaround. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was a very quick turnaround to Paris to Salt Lake City, and um, uh, one of the things that uh, you know that we had talked about a lot in masterclasses and is uh, at least in, in, my, in my talk, I said, how many aspiring you know, artists are out there? And I said, all right, now I want you to take and, and cut out that aspiring part because you're already there. Yeah. You are an artist. You are a person who's contributing to, to the um, artistic culture of society. You're not aspiring. You're just a, at a different part in your journey than everyone else. You know, somebody who's, who's been in the game for quite some time obviously is going to have a little bit more of an advantage over you uh, in the way that they just have a little bit more experience. But I think 
I think we should all be supportive of one another in the fact that we're all kind of on that same road together, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that when, you know, in, in this sort of period of time when studios are reconfiguring and re, um, reimagining what they are and what the new process is, especially with the advent of, you know, generative AI that they all want to take advantage of mm-hmm. as generative AI takes advantage of everyone else. Yeah. Um, when, yeah. when, uh, mid journey decided to sue stable diffusion, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because, uh, they're accusing, uh, stable diffusion of stealing from them when they're using the Leon data set. And you're like, so you're accusing somebody of stealing stuff that you stole? Uh, I... Okay. Yeah. So that was pretty funny. Um, but um, in this sort of new era of computational technology, you know, that kind of, I know, I know a lot of people sort of get lost in that too, you know, and that sort of fuels another, another type of hopelessness that people get into. Not only are they feeling, am I not good enough? But they're feeling, how can I compete with this computer that can generate all this stuff that I want to do in a matter of mere seconds? Yeah, it's like John Henry in the train, right? Yeah, that right. That story. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but you know what? Like, if you want to make art, make art. Yeah. I mean, if that's what you want to do, then do it. Like, you don't need anybody's permission. <laughs> you don't need anybody's, you know, validation. You just do it because you love it. And if you love it, it'll love you back eventually. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, you may struggle. What's the saying? It'll love you back eventually. Because you may struggle, yeah. right? Yeah, Every, yeah, you're going to. Everyone's going to struggle. You yeah. can't help it. You have it. to kind of learn to enjoy the struggle. Like, see it as part of the, the problem. I, you know, and I find that people that have a high level of being able to tolerate being uncomfortable end up going farther. Yeah. Right? There's a famous lecture that John Cleese gave on creativity. John, John Cleese of Monty Python fame. Yes. And if you haven't seen it, then you really should. Because um, in that, he talks about a few different types of the creative process, right? You have to have time. And then the second one is also time. Uh, because you have to have time to set apart to yeah. work on something. Then you have to have time to shut your brain off from other things. I, and I'm probably butchering this. So yeah. just go ahead and watch the John Cleese lecture. Yeah, it's great. Um, it's great. Yeah. But, you know, some of the things he talks about in there about being creative and and, and taking that uncomfortability and sitting with it, right? Because as people, we want to have, like, the answer. We want to have the solution right away, right? Especially in in, in an era where everything is sort of um, an instant gratification, right? Mm -hmm. So the more people can sit with things uncomfortably and sort of stew over them in their mind the more eventually creative your solution is going to be because you've let it, you've, you've been able to ponder on this, on the, on this situation, you know? And, um, so, uh, I am, uh, you know, a Christian and, uh, I go to the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's part of mine, uh, uh, my life and everything. And one of the tenets in that is, is the idea of pondering and being able to, to, you know, sit with something and really try and search your mind out and understand it, yeah. right? And I, d- I think storyboarding and, and storytelling is very, very much that way, you know? Yeah. Where you are having to sit with an idea of a story and be like, well, what's the main idea? What are we getting down to in this story that's important, right? And what's fluff? Mm-hmm. And, what's, and what are we doing that's just funny? Or what are we trying to do? And, you know, you lay out that, those breadcrumbs for people to follow, right? And then they follow along in your story as you lay out these clues of, as, as of what's going on. And um, I think, you know, being able to sit with that and really think about it for long periods of time creates a, a, a more creative product. Yeah, uh, even on pondering, um, I I have a good friend. He consults at Disney, Pixar. Brian McDonald, he's been on the show before. Um, I don't, I, his re- background is not religious, and yet he one day I asked him a certain question about screenwriting, and he said, "I'm not going to give you the answer to that one." He said, "Because we don't we don't value pondering as much in our society as we should," and he he encouraged me to ponder it, and I was like, "Yeah, I get pondering. I'll, I'll do that," <laughs> you know, and 
And that was one of the best things he could have done because the answer I came up with was so much more deep and nuanced than him just giving me a little sound bite, right? Yeah. And uh, I think that is part of the the journey of an artist is learning how to sit with very uncomfortable things because an artist is, in a way, is kind of a con the conscience of society. You know, we kind of filter things that we're experiencing so in society and trying to put them in a way that's beautiful on display, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think you, you also like societally, you come up with like sort of the challenges in every society as well. You know, yeah. there's, there's, you know, always like the hero's journey uh, of some kind in one form or another. Mm -hmm. And you have, uh, you know, a lot of topics that people tend to very think very deeply about and want to bring up in their art. Um, I think one of the biggest problems in modern media is that the message is overtaken the storytelling and it's mess message first and you know some characters and crap you know like this yeah. kind of an afterthought and um well and that kind of um cuts against what i was saying but not what i was meaning right sure. because what i was saying was like we're kind of the conscience but if we think of ourselves like pridefully as the conscience then we're going to end up saying okay what's the most important political talking point putting that forward and then we're not creating art anymore we're creating propaganda but sure yeah yeah so i completely yeah but i mean i think in storytelling too, and in art in general, I think the thing, one of the hardest things you can do is get down to where you, like get down to what you want to create out of your very soul, right? right. So, because everybody's got influences, right? Especially in modern media, we've got access to the internet, we've got all these things that we're looking at all the time. Yeah. And then we get caught up in, in uh, the styles of other people that have come before us, right? Yeah, and then the validation thing, that aggravates the problem, right? Yeah. Because how are you going to actually get down to the real essence of something if you're worried about everybody validating it? Right. Yeah. Right, and then, you know, you get the praise, and then you're like, okay, yeah, I'm doing okay. I'm not my... Because you, you doubt yourself, right? You, you wonder right. if you're going the right way, if you're on the right path, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, if you're improving or not, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so people got get anxious right because they can't sit with that problem of of not knowing yeah. and so they start to go outward and outward and and uh social media i think has sort of exacerbated that issue um but you know when you can get down to who you are as a person and get down to what you like you know and what you want to see on on things that you do um on a philosophical level if anything uh, I think that's where your art comes through, right? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I was at a Comic Con one time in San Diego, and um, I was at the Wacom booth. And this girl comes up to me and wants to talk to me because I'm—I just got done with the presentation, and uh, she showed me her her sketchbook, right? And it's full of all this anime stuff, and it was very well drawn. And I was looking through it, and I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, let's look at this. Let's look at this." And then I, I turn a page, and I said, "Oh, there you are." And she's like, what are you talking about? And it was a drawing of an octopus. And I said, that's you. And she's like, I don't know what you're saying. It's like, look, you didn't have any reference. You didn't have any templates to follow. That's you. That's your interpretation of what an octopus looks like. So, so I, I hopefully she got something out of that, you know, because we do fall into imitating our... Um, for lack of a better word, our, our influences. Yeah. Right, Jesus right. Yeah. yeah. So we, we'll, we'll follow our heroes down and we'll do what they do. But then in the danger is, is, is after you get done with that learning and you learn from the masters, like you shouldn't, I, I, I'm not saying that you shouldn't look at anything yeah, yeah. and, and not, you know, <laughs> you shouldn't, you shouldn't just imitate them either. No. You should learn, uh, like sort of the process, like, are you familiar with Maurice Noble? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, have you read his book? Uh, I looked into it. I have. Okay. So The Noble Approach is a very, very good book. And I would recommend that to any, oh, any designer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, it's become like $200 for the hardcover, but you can get it, I think, for like four. Just a digital copy on Amazon. What's the holdup, bro? What's the holdup? <laughs> time Just kidding. i'm gonna do i'll get i'll look it up first. okay okay you do it you do it get it but um one of the things he said is i don't want people imitating me yeah i want people to know how i approach the art and that's why it's called the noble approach because he said uh, like i don't want people out there just imitating me mm -hmm. i want people to learn how i think about things and not just the uh 
um, the surface ideas, right? Put this line here, put that line there, put that line there, and it's a Maurice Noble drawing. No, no, no. It's much more, you know, cerebral than that. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of, uh, you know, especially when we talk about board art, um, there's a lot of people that talk about the uh, who, what, where, mm -hmm. but not about the how and why. You know, because the, that's the reporter thing, right? You're supposed to, in any good communication, there's a who, what, where, how, and why, right? And so we're talking about the what, the who, and the where a lot, the, the staging of things and uh, some of the camera. But we don't talk about the why they're doing things and the how they're doing things, right? And that's where the real magic happens is in that sort of stuff. You have to have an understanding of what your characters are going through at any given time and um, understand why they're doing what they're doing, how they're going about it. What mannerisms do they show that give them character? You know, do they move fast? Do they move slow? Do they have trouble moving at all? <laughs> you know, yeah. and that kind of speaks to the entertainment value of everything. Because as artists, you know, especially working in media, we're entertainers first, right? Yeah. We're entertainers. And, and I've, I've been going around saying this for, for a while, I guess. Um, but that's our deal is we are entertainers. We just do it in, uh, with using the arts and not as much being on stage. You know, we use a visual arts, I should say, not just the arts, because that's a pretty wide topic. But yeah, that is. <laughs> we use the visual arts to do this sort of work with, you know. But uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a really great combination of all the arts and animation. But we are entertainers first and foremost, and so the entertainment value of our art then becomes the paramount issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So often when I have when I end the show, which we're doing a bit shorter of a show today than we usually do, we usually do forty-five minutes. We're going to go thirty, but uh, I often end with this question. Not bad, huh? No, it's it's actually really good because <laughs> usually I often ask the question like, if if my goal is to get the highest clarity of truth and meaning into a story what approach would you recommend you're already answering it you talked about the who what where but you need to add the why and how right and and try and keep a level of teachability about you because honestly you know every everybody has times where they're sort of blind to a project right you get too close to it you get um sort of in this area where you're not sure what you're looking at anymore, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then, uh, you know, having a good story crew or at least a few friends to rely on to say, hey, I'm, I need to step back from this. I don't have, you know, the week or so to reset and come back to it. Tell me what your honest opinion is. And, you know, so many times I think people get, get sort of offended or hurt or, or – um, something by somebody's honest feedback and you can't do that you have to just take it in for what it is and look at it, things objectively and realize that people aren't out to hurt your feelings 99 percent of the time they're trying to help you it's like that scene from uh from the first uh, lord of the rings movie right when uh, uh bilbo uh trying to accuses gandalf of tr yeah. trying to steal the ring yeah and he's like bilbo baggins <laughs> i'm not trying to rob you like yeah. i'm trying to help you yeah. you know and he's like all right and then he tries to steal the ring anyway um but uh uh you know have taking taking that to, to heart taking that feedback to heart and not getting busted up inside about it um I, it demonstrates a level of emotional maturity that you need to actually do the job professionally, you know, because there's going to be times when people are going to actually really be harsh on you, you know, in a, in a story room. And, you know, there's times where you'll work with a great crew and everybody's going to be awesome, but you have to have that emotional maturity to be able to step back and say, you know, especially if you want to be a story artist for all you story artists yeah. out there, um, the, the drawings are disposable. Like you can't have precious things in the story room. It just doesn't work like that, you know? So um, be resilient. Know that people are trying to help you. And, uh, you know, generally, most of the time, people are trying to help you. Mm. And be honest with yourself about, you know, am I doing my best work? Am I putting forth the effort? Am I making this the best I can make it? You know, or am I 
fuck it, I'll call in a day and want to go play video games with my friends. Uh -huh. You know? So, yeah. Thank you for watching the Directing Animation Livecast, hosted by Scott Weiser, audio version edited by Kira Horowitz, copyright Scott Weiser LLC 2024. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that notification bell.